Turn your Bible today to James chapter 1. We share a message of, of hope and encouragement. Our goal is to do this on the basis of something really solid and secure. It's very possible to create a lot of emotions and, and at times like this, but emotions don't carry you very far. You know, you can be very emotionally excited um, and think you're gonna, your emotions are going to get you out of the snowbank, but the only way it's really going to happen, somebody comes by in a big four-wheel drive with a nylon rope, going to get you out of there. You need substance, and that's what we're offering at this time. James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, <clears throat> Scripture wants us to know that we are to be joyful at all times. One of the things that Jesus said, he said, uh, these words I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. Every day is a gift of God. And every day is a, is a package that comes to us from God. And we're not going to know what's in that package until we open it and spend those hours together as it, as it unfolds for us. So God wants us to approach each day with joy. For the Christian, in the words of the Apostle Paul, for me, uh, to, to die is gain, see, and, and to me, for life is profitable. So it's joy for us, regardless of which side of this we, it falls. And so Scripture tells us to consider it all joy when we encounter the various trials. It talks about the testing your faith. And that's what I want to take some time on today is the testing our faith. Faith that's not tested is re really is not faith. And so God has these things set up in this world so that our faith is tested. It isn't like that uh, God is blindsided by coronavirus uh, 2020 and say, oh, I just didn't see that coming. You know, the, everything is actually orchestrated by God. Uh, God's goal is to bring man to repentance. You know, I personally think some of the pictures given to us in, in uh, the book of Revelation are just kind of general pictures of God's effort to get man to repent, God's effort to turn man back to him. And I personally see that this is one of those things that he's doing because it, it didn't happen accidentally. Um, a virus, I, I took the time to look it up. The coronavirus is uh, 125 uh, nanometers across. Now, a nanometer is so small you can't even comprehend. I think it's what, um, a, a ten billionth of a meter or something like that. Incredibly small. So, so you got this incredibly small thing that's bringing the world's greatest economy to a halt. Okay, <laughs> okay, who can, who can do that, see? And uh, which of us, say, in uh, uh, September of uh, 2019 would have predicted that we'd be getting together under these circumstances? See, this is, this is how God operates. Uh, there's no government on earth that can stop this thing. There's no set of walls you can put up at the borders and tell the coronavirus you're not coming across. It's coming where God wants it and it'll do what God intends it to do. Uh, again, we need to take our precautions. God wants us to do that. But the other side is uh, there's so many things in life that are outside of our control. And this is where our faith comes in, see? So this is a faith test, and uh, we need to, all of us, look at it from the perspective that it's a faith test. Um, the, there's a lot of examples of, of faith in the Bible. I wanted to kind of work on some general and some specifics today. I'd like us to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 gives a, a list of some of the great men of faith. It starts with Abel, whose innocent blood was shed um, on the way, all the way down through. And finally, he gets down to uh, verse, uh, oh, I guess I'll pick it up in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 32. He said, what more shall I say? Hebrews 11:32. Uh, Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah. Those are all judges. Uh, David, Samuel, the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Receive, women received their dead, back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. 
Others experienced mockings and scourging, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in uh, goats, uh, sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And it says, all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. The, the what was promised here is the indwelling Holy Spirit. None of those Old Testament men or women were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. God provided something better for us that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. But the Old Testament is, is loaded with these stories which are basically summarized here in Hebrews chapter 11. All these, these people that had to endure, 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 endure. And uh, they've, their names have gone down written in the book of life because they maintained their faith. Their faith was tested and they passed the test. So it's not going to be surprising if we, under the terms of the new covenant, are, are going to be tested as well. An example that I also wanted to work on a little bit is a New Testament example, uh, the Apostle Paul himself. The uh, record of Paul in the book of Acts after his conversion, after his immersion, is recorded in Acts 9 and talked about in Acts 22. Uh, his record is that very soon, okay, he began to be persecuted. Okay, he, he was uh, in Damascus. Uh, that's where he started preaching in the synagogues. Then he went to Arabia for three years. Then he came back to Damascus, was uh, preaching in the synagogues. Well, they, they tried to kill him in Damascus, so they had to lower him over the wall in a basket to get him out of Damascus. Okay, and then he went to Jerusalem. And uh, so finally he was uh, discussing things with the Jews in Jerusalem, trying to convert them. They tried to kill him. So he ended up going to Tarsus, okay, which is his hometown. Uh, Barnabas went to Tarsus, brought him down to Antioch where there were a lot of uh, Gentiles who had been uh, immersed into Christ. And, and uh, it was from Antioch then that Paul went out on his first missionary journey. On that first missionary journey, he eventually gets to a city uh, in Lystra called Lystra outside of you know, what's now central Turkey. And uh, the Jews got upset at him and stoned him, left him, drug him out of the city and left him for dead. Okay. Um, he was jailed. You know, he was beaten. I mean, he, his record is throughout the book of Acts. He was brought before court in Corinth. And the only thing that, that slowed that down was the, the judge threw it out of court. Um, Paul's faith was tested time and time and time again. If you turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Uh, well, let me, before I do 2 Corinthians 11, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. There's another thought or two I want to throw in here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just kind of a reference that Paul makes here in passing. He's talking about, you know, the resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. 1 Corinthians 15, 32. He said, If from human motives I fought with the wild beast at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. See, interesting, he just sticks that in there, that he had to fight with the wild beast at Ephesus. Um, you know, if you take a look at the uh, Roman theaters, the Roman amphitheaters, uh, there are lots of them. And uh, they like to have these games, and they were pretty bloodthirsty. So one of the things that they enjoyed doing was uh, feeding Christians to the lions. And uh, in Ephesus, apparently, Paul got to experience that. If you, if you turn to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, it's another reference that he has, and I think this has got to do with what he went through in Ephesus. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. He said, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. You know, I mean, that could be a reference to being delivered from Satan, but I think it has more directly to do with actually facing the lions, the wild beasts that he talks about in Ephesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he makes another, another mention of that. It's interesting, in the book of Acts, uh, Luke doesn't even, uh, Luke who wrote the book of Acts, doesn't even bring out the suffering that happened in Ephesus or, or the Roman province of Asia. In verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, 
He said, We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. And indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we've set our hope. You know, it's a pretty powerful statement for Paul to say, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Okay, sentence of death within ourselves. That persecution, not even listed in the book of Acts, was intent. And my point is, is that Paul's faith is being tested here. That he's, is he going to keep going in the forward in the face of persecution, in the face of difficulty? Uh, or is he just going to give up and say, okay, I quit? Uh, not, not Paul, not, not the former Saul of Tarsus. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, then, kind of the summary statement that he goes through here. He's actually challenging the, the wannabe apostles and, and, uh, and church leaders in, in, in Corinth that are challenging his authority as an apostle. And they're, they're challenging his authority as an apostle because they also want to challenge the doctrine that he's preaching. So he's basically going to say, all right, uh, you know, congregation, take a look here. Uh, what, what are the persecution, what difficulty these uh, wannabes going through compared to what I've already had to go through? And he said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 21, in the middle of the verse, he said, but in whatever respect anyone else is bold. And he said, I'm speaking foolishly. I'm bold my, just bold myself. He, in other words, he's apologizing for having to be pushed into the position here of having to even bring this up. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Okay, you want to start matching pedigrees? Okay, we can match the pedigrees. Okay, you're not going to match up. Are they servants of Christ? He said, I speak as if insane. I am our soul. More so. Okay, now listen. Far more labors, far more imprisonments. Yeah, these imprisonments aren't even hardly listed. Okay. Beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. Okay, <clears throat> that's a lot for an individual to go through. But he did it, and he did it successfully. That's why he would say, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. To say, well, Paul's kind of an extreme example. I mean, he's the apostle. Yeah, he's, he's going to go through all that. He was even told at... Uh, you know, before he was immersed, he was even told that he was going to be shown all the things that he would suffer uh, for the Lord's sake. So uh, what about the, the common Christian? What about the, the, the guys that were Christians like the rest of us? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 8 here and see how this played out for these pretty new Christians. Okay, the church came off the ground in Acts chapter 2 um, with the joy and excitement. Some disturbances, but mostly to the apostles. But Acts chapter 8, okay, things are going to crank up here. And uh, Acts 8, 1, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. Stephen's the first martyr to die for the faith. Martyr, by the way, is a, a Greek word that means witness. And um, witness came to, or martyr came to be the word attached to the the early Christians who died because they wouldn't shut up about Jesus Christ. Okay, So that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now, these are your average Christians like us that are getting scattered here. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women, he'd put them in prison. Now, these are the early Christians here. And these are the people that lived in Jerusalem and Judea. And uh, the uh, jackboots are busting down the doors of their houses and coming in, hauling off the Christian men and women, and leaving the kids squalling in the house. Now, this, is, this is the first century, this is the average Christian as this thing started off, okay? And so it says, therefore, verse 4, those who have been scattered went about preaching the word. 
Acts chapter 8, there's another, or excuse me, Acts chapter 9, there's another description here, just a, a phrase or two. Uh, Acts 9.1, it says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. See, he was actually breathing, just flames of persecution just coming out of the mouth of uh, one Saul of Tarsus. This persecution was intense. And that's how the church began. The church began in the cradle of persecution. In other words, their faith were tested. Okay, these guys, I don't know, maybe, I don't know how long it is here, four, maybe three or four years possibly into it. Uh, you would, sometimes you would consider these guys to be, quote, baby Christians. But they're undergoing this intense persecution. Um, and uh, the idea is, is that their faith is being tested and they have been given the tools necessary to maintain their faith. In fact, as they not only maintain their faith, they spread it. If we go to Acts 11, where uh, Luke kind of picks up the story of what happened when they got scattered. Acts 11, chapter, uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. <clears throat> says, So then, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews of the law. But by this time then the word, the conversion of Cornelius reaches them. So the door is open for Gentiles. But there are some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks. In other words, the Gentiles also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. So the picture here is that when these guys got scattered, okay, the test of their faith then, were they, were they going to maintain the faith? Were they going to continue to meet in their assemblies? Uh, were they going to start assemblies where they were and keep things going? See, God, God really wants Christians to be involved in all the creative ways that we can to be spreading the word. Some of us are pretty good about talking to people and we can kind of get them started, but we need help from other people who have more knowledge to take them further steps. God really wants us to be able to engage in that sort of teamwork. God wants all of us to be as equipped as possible, but that's a, that's a long process. I've had an opportunity to have Bible studies with a lot of you over the years, and one of the things that I can do is I can usually answer any question, you know, any question. And I do appreciate when you text your questions in, for example, and have the opportunity to answer those um, on Wednesdays or, or Lord's Days. And, uh, but, you know, most Christians aren't going to be able to do that because that's a lot of years of experience and, and a lot of being able to handle a lot of situations. So, but each person needs to be able to do what they can. And when you do what you can, uh, you can take a person quite a few steps down that road and, and step by step they can be put in a position where somebody that maybe has a little bit more knowledge or more experience can help them go the next step of the way. That's what God really wants us to do. Um, one time Jesus was uh, coming along and a pretty good sized crowd was there watching him and a pretty good sized crowd was following him. And um, there was a guy there by the name of Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus was a short guy. I don't know how tall he was, but he, he wasn't small enough to see over the crowd. So what he did is he ran ahead a little bit and climbed up in the tree to, to be able to just see Jesus. And uh, when Jesus got to the tree, he stopped. And he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Now, how did he know, number one, he's up in the tree? And number two, what, how do you know what his name is? You know, the point is, is that Jesus knows everybody's name. You know, there was another time earlier when when a, um, a future apostle named King Nathaniel, named Nathaniel came to where Jesus was. And uh, uh, Jesus said, you're an Israelite, you don't have any guile. And Nathaniel says, well, how do you know me? And Jesus said, uh, uh, I actually saw you when you were under the fig tree okay, earlier. And uh, so Jesus knows everybody's name. Okay, that's part of his prophetic ministry. And so he knew Zacchaeus' name, and he said, uh, Zacchaeus, I'm going to have lunch at your house today. So Zacchaeus climbs down from the tree, and Jesus now is walking along with this Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus was a tax gatherer. Okay, that's, that's a pretty hated position anyway. But not only that, he's a chief tax gatherer. In other words, he's, he's uh, in charge of a whole bunch of other tax gatherers. So he's, you know, he's the baddest of the bad, okay? And... Uh, so there's a murmur then as Jesus is walking along in the crowd 
So he's, Jesus is even going to eat with sinners. I mean, what kind of guy is Jesus? At that point, Jesus stops. <laughs> and he said, look, it, he's the son of Abram. He's a descendant of Abraham. Just like you guys are. And so he said, salvation has come to this man's house. He said, because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's the church's mission, is to continue to seek and save that which is lost. And so regardless of what happens to us, like in the early church, then we need to maintain our faith and spread, our, spread the word around and distribute it to as many people as possible. I know a lot of us are under lockdown right now, and, um, and that is as it should be, otherwise the the health capacity, the, the country going to be stain, strained. I've kind of been keeping a running log of, of the spread of the virus um, in uh, U.S. and particularly in Montana and, and also now in Gallatin County. And, uh, you know, it is following the course of, of just about doubling every three days, just kind of like it was been predicted. And so you run that ex exponential curve out, it, it moves up pretty fast. So I encourage you to... to continue to maintain the, those distances as much as you can and and uh, you know I hate to see it happen I mean it's, it's against you know everything I you know really like or want to do but I recognize that that that's what's necessary and that uh, you know I've looked at this virus I tried to do my due diligence and um, it's going to become evident that it is nothing to mess with so but that's uh, their faith was tested and uh, they did carry the message then to all those other places. That's what God wants us to be able to do. If you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it wasn't just the, the church in Jerusalem then that was persecuted. It's, it's pretty much the record across the board. One example of this is brought out when Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. This is a congregation that uh, began on his first mission or second missionary journey. And... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, <coughs> verse 13, he says, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which performs its work in you who believe. Just a side comment here. So the word of God is actually working in us and strengthening us. That's why we want to you know, take some time in prayer using the Word of God as a basis a lot of times uh, to actually read or as some of us listen to sections of the Scripture. We want to, want to take time to do that. He said, For you, brethren, verse 14, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. See, so the church in Thessalonica also had, went through the same type of persecution as described in the book of Acts. Uh, all it gets is a slight reference in the book of Acts and then just a couple lines here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. But they, they suffered. Um, you know, if you go to Romans chapter 8, in other words, their faith was tested. And uh, the, the record is that, that they, they passed the test. He asked the question in Romans 8.35. Romans 8.35, he says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine and nakedness or peril or sword? We, we occasionally come cycling back through this passage of Scripture to, to point out that just because we're going through some of these things doesn't mean that God abandoned us. But here's the a, here's a line. It says, Just as it's written, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. See, those were actually being literally carried out in the days of the first century church. Those, those early Christians, they were tested in a major way. I brought, uh, that, as Christianity got to Rome, I, I got some things uh, offline. We can go to Tacitus on persecution in, uh, you know, kind of on, on the slide here. Um, Tacitus was a Roman historian in uh, he, he looked back here to what happened was uh, the city of Rome burnt. And uh, so Nero decided to blame the burning of Rome on Christians who, because they wouldn't participate in the, in the idols, the, uh, 
you know, the, the Romans tended to hate them. The Roman t people tend to be very suspicious of the Christians. And so to get rid of the port report that Nero, in other words, had burnt Rome himself, Nero, this is the Roman historian Tacitus now, who's a contemporary. He's looking back at, at this. He said, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt, inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. You can see how they spelled it a little bit different. <clears throat> By the populace. Christus, which is Latin really for Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, bro again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. In other words, Christianity spread out from Jerusalem and eventually made its way to Rome. And this is the Roman historian calling it evil uh, and a class hated for their abominations. This is early Christians. And uh, so it gives you the idea that they thought they had it checked when uh, Jesus was executed, but the problem was it just spread even more, okay? So the Christians were persecuted uh, in Rome. And I have here a, a picture uh, uh, of uh, the torches of Nero painted by um, uh, Henrik uh, Slamirdischke. Um, according to Tacitus, uh, Nero used Christians as human torches. And so you can kind of see on the right there, you see the along the wall, the, the Christians. And it was a matter of record that for his house parties, uh, he would uh, put uh, in the backyard, he'd set up posts and, and Christians would actually burn there alive on those posts uh, to provide uh, lighting for the backyard party. That gives you an idea how far that sunk and, and what the early Christians went through. Like I say, these were just common, average Christians. These weren't... Uh, special guys like the Apostle Paul. These were the, the Christians of the first century. And uh, it just couldn't be put down in spite of that persecution. My point is that their faith was tested. And they passed the test. The, uh, one of our songs says, the faith by which they conquered death. You know, still our shining shield. You know, faith is the victory. So, again, that, that record spread pretty fast. It's interesting to me that Tacitus... Here just has that uh, uh, a reference to Christ as, uh, as a somewhat contemporary historian. You know, the, the modern, I guess, intellectual elite, if we put that title on them, would try to deny that Christ ever existed, that, that he's a sort of a mythological figure, some itinerant uh, Palestinian rabbi about whom various legends grew up, including his crucifixion and resurrection from the dead. Uh, of course, Tacitus indicates that, no, they knew that the record was he was crucified uh, at the time of Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> but they can't deny the record of the church. You know, God made sure that the church spread so fast. And uh, it's interesting, see, then, the, had the church not been persecuted, there wouldn't have been any notice taken of the church. But the fact that the church was persecuted... Uh, I can say they were used, uh, they were fed to the lions, used as spectacles in the gladiators' ring, all sorts of things, in the, not only in Rome, but, uh, but the amphitheaters and theaters throughout the Roman Empire. So many, <clears throat> many suffered. And uh, in the, the widespreadness of that suffering showed that the church spread very rapidly. And God used that to actually get the historical record there so that the existence of the church and Christianity cannot be denied. It's interesting when you read uh, oh, something like uh, Gibbon's uh, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, where he talks about what he calls primitive Christianity. You can tell he has a great respect for the Christians of the first century. But when Christianity uh, tried to become more popular and more accepted, they, they lost it in uh, Gibbon has no respect for that. The uh, other writers, you know, when they look back, um, um, Frank Slaughter wrote a book called The Robe, and uh, they made a movie of it, you know, a couple generations ago. 
But in the book, The Robe, you know, the story of the robe is that the soldier that got the robe that they gambled for, um, one of the soldiers that watched uh, over Jesus got the robe. And so the book gets the title, The Robe, over that seamless robe that uh, Jesus uh, wore. And of course, it's a fictitious story. Uh, <clears throat> it was made up. But at one point, <clears throat> now the Roman emperor, emperor Caligula is looking at Christianity. And uh, Caligula, this is Frank Slaughter's, you know, uh, words being put in Caligula's mouth. Um, Caligula looks at that and he said, you know, the Christian is an interesting individual. He says, as long as he's on foot, <clears throat> he's a formidable soldier. <clears throat> but give him a horse, he's of no uh, threat at all. See, the picture is as long as Christianity was simple, straightforward, formidable. But when it started to become popular, when it tried to do the things to, to <clears throat> court the smiles of the, the emperor and his court, then it lost its power, it lost its punch. See, it was of no value anymore. So God allowed these early Christians to suffer, and we want to take that as an example. They never lost their faith. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, If, you, if I was going to put a subtitle on the book of First Peter, the subtitle I would put on it is How to Be Happy Though Suffering. And, uh, you know, I, none of us like the prospect of suffering, but it's, it's uh, part of something that God allows to go on in this world. And what God does is He doesn't tell Christians that they're not going to suffer. What He does is He he gives them the tools to come through the suffering successfully, victoriously. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. I want to pause here for just a second. Born again. God in His great mercy, mercy has caused us to be born again. Four times in the scripture the expression is uh, born again is used. Slightly different wording. Uh, John chapter 3, two of them, and 1 Peter chapter 1 are the other two. Now, Jesus introduced the concept of being born again, or as he more literally put it, born from above. In John 3.3, 3, he told Nicodemus, unless a person is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the way you're, you're born again or born from above, he further explained. He said, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so, Immersion is what he's talking about. He's looking forward to what's going to happen from Acts chapter 2 onward. To be born of the Spirit, as he put it. <clears throat> so, to be born again, you can't just do this accept Jesus into your heart. Uh, you can't just have been sprinkled as a baby and think that does it. You have to be born again in accordance with the terms of the Scripture. And we spent some time in class talking about that, but you have to repent and be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, Paul said, or Peter said, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 6, or Romans chapter 6, Paul talked about buried with Christ in immersion, and then resurrected to, to walk in newness of life. And uh, that's how you're born again. Now, if you are born again, you're born again to what he calls a living hope, not a dead one. <laughs> See, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because he lives, we live. Because he's resurrected, he, we will be resurrected. See, and as he put it, to obtain an inheritance imperishable. You know, um, one of the things that sometimes happens at our house, especially when we were traveling 2,000, 2,500 miles a week, was something would uh, perish. You know, it, it, uh, <clears throat> you know little things that kind of get away on us, or we just wouldn't be home for a week, uh, or eat a meal at home for a week, and... And then all of a sudden, something that we thought was still good, oops, it wasn't, okay? Perished, okay? Perishable. 
Well, our inheritance is imperishable. That's pretty exciting. Okay, uh, it's undefiled. Okay, it's uh, it's not going to become corrupted. It's not going to be um, something you just want to throw in the garbage. It's undefiled, and it's not going to fade away. It's not, you know, our salvation is not written with a, a fading ink. Our salvation is will not fade away, and furthermore, it's reserved in heaven for you. I remember one time I was coming into Lima, Ohio, and uh, for the meeting they have there, the <clears throat> the rally for Christ that they have at the end of June every year, and uh, so I I came to this uh, motel. And uh, I had a reservation that I got uh, um, online, and they said they didn't have the reservation. So I had a confirmation number, and uh, they still tried to maintain that they, that they didn't have a reservation. I said, well, here's my confirmation number right here. I said, okay. So they gave me a room, okay? Now, I did not like the way the motel operated. You know, it seemed to me pretty cheesy. And uh, so... I didn't leave any of my luggage in the in the motel room overnight, or when I was gone. I stayed overnight. I had a two-night reservation. So, so when I came back then, at the end of the long day, I went to my room. The key wouldn't work. So I went to the office, and, of course, it's late. It's 11 o'clock at night, having to find somebody who, who can do something. Finally, the owner came out, and she was she was the one I had trouble with earlier. And she said, well, you, you, did, you, you leave no stuff in your room. I said, well, no, I didn't. She said, well, that means you're not coming back. <laughs> so we went the room to somebody else. I said, well, <clears throat> I paid for this reservation. And I said, you can't do this to me. And so they finally cleared out sort of a storage area. <laughs> It was a motel room that's been used as a storage area, and that's what I stayed overnight. Uh, <clears throat> I like this reservation here in, in uh, 1 Peter 1.4. This is reserved from heaven, and the, the deal's not going to change on us. See, and I'm excited about that. Um, protected by the power of God through faith. See, it's our faith is actually what activates the power of God to protect us. And so God really wants us to be able to have that faith and maintain it. As he put it, for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. He goes on in, in 1 Peter 1, 6. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. See, there's the testing of our faith, right? Uh, distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, May be, result, may be found a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you've not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. I want you to notice what, what God's looking for. See, God's looking for. Um, near Bozeman, is a old mining camp called Virginia City, Montana. It's the site of the world's uh, richest placer gold ever. Now, placer gold is is gold that you dig. It's there in the stream bed bottom. It's it's the nuggets, and you have to pan it and stuff like that. It was discovered, I think, uh, late uh, 1863, and uh, you know eventually there were 12,000 miners <coughs> working the, the gulch, as it's called. And uh, what they're looking for is they're looking for gold. Okay, that's, uh, and so actually the gold was actually about 20 feet down in the sand for the most part. It was an older stream bed, and they had to dig down through a layer of sand and then actually kind of mining down underneath the sand. It was a pretty, pretty rugged deal. <clears throat> but in contrast to uh, placer mining, it's what you call hard rock. And uh, this would be your, your mine on a hillside where you're, you find a vein and you work your quartz vein. And so what the old prospectors would do is they'd, they'd want to know if there was enough value in that vein to consider hard rock mining it. So what they do is they'd take a chunk of the, the ore that looked pretty good and uh, they'd, uh, they had a, what was called a mortar and pestle with them. 
and they'd take and they'd, they'd take that chunk of that roar or take it back to their, their camp and they'd grind that into a really fine powder. And uh, then they'd heat it and they'd run it through some things there. And by the time they got done, any of the, any of the pure gold was just left as a, kind of a little chunk of gold in the bottom of the, of the mortar after they did all the heating and you know, trying it with mercury or whatever they did along the way. That little chunk of gold in the bottom was called the proof. See, the proof is then actually that there is gold. And there's an expression called the proof is in the pudding. And that comes from a custom from the uh, kings of England at, uh, quote, Christmas time, where, you know, they'd bring the pudding out, you know, maybe figgy pudding or whatever. And in one of the, one of the puddings would be a gold coin, okay? And so the person that, that found that gold coin in the pudding was, was the person who was, you know, given the gift. In other words, the proof is in the pudding. That's where that expression comes from. So the proof is the, is the gold coin. Now, the proof of our faith, then, is what God's looking for. He, he's going to put us through the mortar and pestle. He's going to grind us and, and put us through whatever has to be put, we have to be put through to find faith. That's what he's looking for. Now, uh, if something's called fool's gold, which is an iron sulfate compound, okay, when it undergoes a test of fire, it just fizzles and sputters, and it's pretty clearly. But gold, gold, the noble metal, is essentially uncombined. And so it, it comes through the fire very successfully. Now, what I've always noted about this passage is, is pure gold does not mind the test of fire. If something's full gold, fool's gold, it does not want to be tested by fire. But the pure gold says, bring the test. You know, I don't mind the test. So our faith is what God's looking for. I remember having a, a Bible study in, uh, in Great Falls one time, and uh, we were kind of meeting in an old hospital. It had been turned into some small offices and stuff. And there was a little foyer area where we were actually having the Bible study. And um, about this time, the elevator opened, and an older gentleman walked in, kind of a rancher type. He knew some, some of the people, so he came over and sat down at our table. And, uh, you know, he listened to the Bible study for about 10 minutes, and then he kind of <coughs> reared back in his chair, and he says, well, I'll tell you. He said, uh, I believe if a feller's honest, treats his neighbors right, honest in his business dealings, uh, he'd be all right. He says, I can worship God a lot better up here in one of the high hills looking at the front range than I can one of your fancy church buildings anyway. And I thought about it for a second, so I reared back in my chair and I says, well, I'll tell you, if I was going to appear before a judge, I think I'd want to know what the judge is looking for. Now, what the judge is looking for is faith. He's looking for our faith as he defines faith in the scripture. Our faith is going to include our repentance our faith is going to include our confession that Jesus is Lord and the continuing confession that Jesus is Lord, even in the face of persecution. Our faith is going to include our immersion into Him. We're sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For all of us who've been immersed into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. God's faith is defined in the Scriptures, and that's what He's looking for. And so He allows the testing to go on. So He's going to find out what the, the proof of our faith is. So when we know what God's looking for, that helps us to understand then the kind of people that we ought to be. Uh, our faith then is what's going to result in praise and glory and honor. And it's pretty plain. He says, even though tested by fire, God never promised Christians that they were going to avoid all tests. God never promised Christians that, that life was going to be, earthly life was going to be a bowl of cherries. Never promised that. See, what he's looking for is faith. And so he's got the fiery trial, as he put it, set in motion to determine who's got faith or not. Now, our job then is to make sure that we are of the faith, uh, the way the scripture would put it, to make sure that we maintain our commitment intact, that we never allow the earthly circumstances to discourage us, to keep moving forward day by day, step by step, regardless of what God allows to come our way. 
you know, we, we do live in the challenging time, but so be it. You know, I didn't have a choice to be born in, in 1947. Um, I did have a choice to be immersed into Christ in uh, March 14th, uh, 1971. I, I did have that choice. And I have a choice every single day to decide whether today I keep going or whether, whether today I bail. <clears throat> whether, if I bail, then I'm fool's gold. <clears throat> if I successfully come through the fire, that's the pure gold of faith that God is looking for. And the same is true for all of us. What's the result? Well, he keeps talking about a salvation. In verse 5, for example, here in 1 Peter 1, salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Our salvation is our resurrection body, receiving the proper resurrection at Jesus' second coming. Now, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be faithful every beat of our heart, every breath that we take, until such time as he decides that our earthly life is no more so that at the second coming of Jesus Christ, we might receive the resurrection from the dead. I want to close with Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, the, the apostle talks a little bit about this, about our, our resurrection from the dead. But he doesn't call it that. He calls it the redemption of our body. See, there's three words that are generally interchangeable in the scripture. Redemption deliverance and salvation. And so there's a, there's a salvation or a redemption that we yet await, and that's our resurrection from the dead at the last trumpet. So he said in verse 22, Romans 8, 22, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. You know, everybody talks about this earth being harmonious. You know, every, all the, everything lives in harmony. And uh, Columbus messed up the harmony of the Western Hemisphere by, by coming and, quote, bringing Christianity in. And, you know, that, that's a ridiculous look at things. Uh, the earth is just a food chain, okay? Um, you know, um, little tiny animals are eating little tiny plants, okay? Um, all kinds of animals eat the little tiny animals, okay? And then bigger animals eat smaller animals. And, uh, you know, at the top of the food chain is, is man, okay, man and grizzly bears. And uh, so it's nice to know we, we share that together. I guess maybe if it's in a contest, the grizzly bear might even be at the top of the food chain above that. But the point is, is that God, that's all earth is, is a food chain. It's not living in harmony at all. It's, it's something eating, something eating, something. And uh, in the midst of it, you have the, the pain, the suffering, the death. Anybody has ever watched an eagle or hawk get a gopher know that it's, it's not, uh, not harmony, okay? So the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now is the way that the Apostle Paul described it. Verse 23, not only this, but also we ourselves having the first, first fruits of the Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, our guarantee of our resurrection from the dead, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting eagerly for the adoption of our adoption of son, the redemption of our body. Eagerly, eagerly. That's the way the scripture puts it. For in hope we've been saved, hope that seems not hope. Who hopes for what he already sees? If we hope with what we do not see, with perseverance, we eagerly, wait eagerly for it. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us with perseverance to continue to look forward to our positive resurrection from the dead, to really, from the, on the basis of scripture, to have put our faith, our trust in the Almighty, to entrust our souls to a faithful creator in doing what's right. That's what God wants us to do. So as we come to a close this morning, just appreciate your kind attention. I do encourage you to move forward in faith. Uh, if you'd like to join us on Wednesday night at uh, 7 p.m. Mountain Time, we have a, a message uh, out of the book of Hebrews for you. And uh, just look forward to sharing and, and encouraging one another. In the meantime, very thankful for the social media and the means we have of maintaining contact, even though we can't physically uh, be with each other, and to maintain contact with each other all across the world. Totally amazing that we can do that. So